Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. This is a recent reads for nine books. Anton Her, Towards Eternity. Dag Solstadt, Professor Anderson's Knight, translated by uh, Agnes Scott Langeland, translated from the Norwegian. Uh, Thomas Bernhard, Walking, translated by Kenneth J. Northcott. Sergio Chef, oh, Chefek, apologies, butchered that name, Argentinian author. Uh, this is called My Two Worlds and is translated by Margaret B. Carson. Um, Maria Gabriel Lansol, The Geography of Rebels, the trilogy, translated by uh, Audrey Young. Kate Atkinson, Death at the Side of the Rook. Poetry Collection, uh, Victoria Chang with My Back to the World. Uh, to the Friend Who Did Not Save My Life by French writer Hervé Guibert, translated by by Maggie, uh, no, uh, Edwin Dwight. Is that right? No. Sorry, <laughs> translated by Linda Coverdale. So it gives the three people who sort of do introductions and afterwards but didn't get the translator on the front cover. Tut tut. Stand up for translators' rights. Uh, talking of which, uh, non fiction, This Little Art by Kate Briggs, a long essay about translations. But I'm going to start with the fiction. Oh. So, Toward Eternity. Funnily enough, Anton Herr is mainly known as a translator. This is his debut novel. Uh, and very good it is too. It's a bit science fictionally in the line of um, Olaf Stapledon's uh, First and Last Men, which is one of my favourite science fiction uh, books, in that this is sort of about uh, evolving mankind through a mixture or a blend of nanotechnology and sort of uploading uh, in digital form consciousness, individual consciousnesses, to then transfer into the physical body that's been built through nanotechnology. Uh, but it, it goes through various generations of, of evolution and how that looks down the line, which so does Stapledon's uh, First and Last Men. Um, but what I really liked about this book is as part of the drive to, uh, you know, attain immortality for human beings or immortality through sort of regeneration or a bit like cloning, but not quite, is that it's uh, poetry and language are situated at the heart of them, because in that way, it's opening up questions of, well, what is it to be human? You know, I personally don't believe in the soul, but... It's a useful concept of that sort of essence of humanity. What makes us quintessentially human and how can you reproduce that? And as I say, by putting language and particularly poetry at the heart of that, equating them to the sort of highest values and attainments of, of mankind, it gives the uh, human characters or, or sort of post-human characters a chance um, you know, to retain that human spark. And I just think there were lots of really, you know, it, it crackles along quite quickly because it's spanning through generations. Plot-wise, it, 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 it sort of romps along. But as I say, there are also interesting disquisitions on these, on, on the nature of humanity, but also particularly the role of poetry and language, which I really, really appreciated and I thought made it a really excellent read. Not overly heavy, you know the plot drives you through it, so I gave it five stars. I'm just going to read a couple of a couple of bits. So this is where uh, the daughter of the person who developed this program right at the beginning uh, is interviewing one of the uh, sort of prototypes. Um, Can you tell me what Dr. Ham was trying to do with you? What was the hypothesis he was trying to prove? Dr. Han used his specialisation in Victorian poetry and modern subjectivity to prove human subjectivity was the product of language, not exclusively the product of neurophysiological emergent behaviour. He devised Turing tests for AI, eventually branching out to creating his own AI that would pass such tests. 
So our personalities and humanity aren't recorded in language, they're created through language. Both correct, Dr. Biko. Recorded and created. And you've passed Yong Hun's Turing tests. I have. I passed every Turing test available at the time of my last instant instant instantation. Can't say this word of my last instantiation, which was three years ago. So language is like DNA. She mused out loud. It stores and creates our humanness, the abstraction that makes flesh, literal flesh in one, metaphorical flesh in the other. Dr. Han believed poetry is one of the highest forms of human thought, a feat of engineering much like any human-made piece of computer code. He believed that we die and disappear, but leave behind our humanity to be picked up in our art, in our languages. He said many people held this view. And do you? He left so much of himself in you. Do you feel he left his humanity behind in you? To a degree, yes. His priority with me, however, was to enable my growth as a human personality through my own language production, not to perpetuate or produce his own personality or subjectivity. So, as I say, there's just, you know, lots of big, interesting ideas. Touched on lightly, you know, it's not a book that just sort of, you know, intellectually dry conversations all the way through. It is it is sort of plot and character-led. Um, and, you know, one, of course, on the one side, you've got sort of pure... Uh, poetry and language and beauty but on the other hand if you can produce these clones sort of endlessly then you're producing armies to fight because there's no stake you just you know if they get wiped out the and this is towards the end of the book if if the if the clone army gets wiped out in the war then you just produce another production line of clone armies so you know as usual with humanity it's both ways um poetry was a weapon like guns and ships and settlers bodies it was weaponized language, loaded like bullets into the minds of its soldiers, generals and colonial governors. And while there were many noble verses and poets, those who've helped many people, including myself, achieve a humanity beyond what we otherwise could have had, those same verses of poets would be used to justify genocide on one hand, while rhapsodizing about human decency on the other. It all depended on how it was read. A poem was a piece of code that could be instant, yeah, this word again, instantiated into light or dark. The only thing that prevented a dark manifestation in my particular instantiation of my base code was Dr. Han's care, his love. So again, giving with one hand, taking away with the other. So having just rhapsodised about poetry and language being at the heart of preserving the human soul, there's many examples of poetry being either composed or wielded by colonial oppressors. So in the First World War, for example, in the gaps between the bombardments, all, and I say all, the British um, officer classes in the trenches got out their books to read, be it poetry or, or be it fiction or non-fiction. But, you know, poetry was, was to the fore for that. So here are men waging the most bloodiest carnage and in their downtime they're reading books of poetry. So I just thought this book was excellent. Five stars. And on to Dag Solstad, Professor Anderson's Night. So I've only ever read one other Dag Solstad book before, which has the wonderful title of uh, Novel 11, Book 18. But unfortunately, from my experience of that book was the title was the best thing about it. I thought the text was unremarkable. But uh, I'll, I was talking to someone over on uh, Substack, and she persuaded me to, you know, give this, uh, give him another go with this this book. And initially, I thought, mm, here we go again. The structure and the form of this novel is all wrong. It doesn't serve it, it to best purpose. But actually, by the end, I was completely won over. It's a really interesting reading experience. So basically, this guy, um, he's a professor. He's in his 50s. He's divorced, lives on his own. It's Christmas Eve. And he sits down to the full ritual of a Christmas meal. And he's dressed up and he's got every dish that you're supposed to have traditionally. And he's eating this in his dining room on his own. And, you know, having the drinks in between the courses, all that sort of stuff. And after the meal, he gets up, uh, he stretches his legs and he looks out of his uh, apartment window and he sees what he thinks is a, a murder, a woman being strangled by a man in the, in the apartment opposite. And we're very much in rear window territory. And that's the start of the book. And it's really effective. So you've got this lonely, isolated guy 
and then you've got the, the, the sort of the setup for a detective novel. He decides he can't ring the police there and then because he's had too much to drink, and and you know they'll 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 think that it's a prank or or, or it's just a drunk. Next day he wakes up, and he was he's being invited to friends of his for the actual Christmas Day meal. So he decides that he needs to talk to talk this through with his friends. You know, twenty twenty four hours later after the the murder. Can he still contact the police kind of thing? So he's, he's resolved to go and talk to his mate. To the extent that uh, he's due at 8 o'clock or 7 o'clock and he's going to arrive an hour early, which will inconvenience the wife who's, you know, preparing the food and stuff. But he thinks, no, 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 I, I'm going to tell her not to worry. I've just, I just need to talk to this guy, my mate. So he goes there an hour early and fails to bring it up, which is never really explained and is a bit of a motif that his motives are never really explained from this point on. He didn't call the police initially because he thought, you know, they'd hear that he was a bit drunk and not take him seriously. So that was sort of explained, his sort of thought patterns. But all the other times that he fails to basically reveal that he's the only person who's seen this, he never, ever reveals to anyone else. And each time he sort of takes his decisions that sort of veer away quite violently. And they never explained. So that was slightly unsatisfactory. So the dinner party, the Christmas dinner party happens. And it's a, like an intellectual debate about how they're all sort of radical, you know, former radicals in their 50s. You know, um, none of them uh, have been able to sort of keep up their, you know, they're still on the left, but they're not radical like they were. And he's the only sort of one who's into the arts. He's a professor of literature. And they discuss the connection between radical politics and the avant-garde. And the argument sort of progresses to the fact that it's not really an avant-garde, it's more a modernity. And that he looks across the table and of all his fellow dinner mates, the only one who has moved as modernity itself changes into new registers each generation is the host of the party. All the rest of them are still stuck with the modernity that, that inspired them in their sort of heady teenage years. In his case, it was uh, literature and uh, the literature of, of, of the time. And there's also, and this is where it sets up a really interesting theme, whereby they're not, I mean, they are bourgeois now. They've reached an age and a level of material comfort where they are bourgeois. But he's trying to uh, justify it away by saying, no, no, we're not, we're not, as a class bourgeois, we yes, we have individual bourgeois aspirations. He himself likes fine Italian suits. The host likes um, sports cars. Another guy likes um, boats, owning boats and stuff. And he's trying to justify as, no, these are all individual choices. They're not um, sort of demonstrative of a class uh, aspirational attitude. So he, he goes back... And uh, he's watching uh, this guy again, rear window territory. He's looking at, you know, he's expected the guy, he doesn't know if the guy even lives there. He's expected the guy to have done a runner, but he spots him across the road. So, no, he's still there, therefore he's, he must live there. So he, he works out the guy's name from the nameplates on the, on the doorbells outside. So he knows his name now. Um, but this... Then we get another lurch, another veering towards uh, unexplained action. Where he, he suddenly panics and decides, OK, well, this guy's not going away. He's not going to do a runner. He's going to be here at least to the new year. So I, Professor Anderson, I'm going to take a skiing trip to Trondheim. Um, not really explain why. And he meets up with uh, old friends there. The, the old friend has married a much younger woman and they get him to stay with them. And again, there's a sort of intellectual discussion between him and, and the guy about the nature of art and how it, um, it's really uh, and what he calls, I can't remember the exact word, but something sort of nostalgic that we preserve the art of the ancient world and all of this, but it doesn't really speak to us and our situation in the here and now. So, for example, if you think about sort of Shakespeare plays, that they try and bring up to date by staging, say, um, Hamlet in Stalin's Politburo or um, 
you know, the, uh, the sort of gangsterism of the of Prohibition era for Macbeth or, or whatever, just to try and make it relevant to a modern audience and the problems with this, uh, which is something that obviously he studies. And then they, he, prom he, say, he offers to take that to his really posh... He's staying in a hotel. He's, he's going to take that to the really posh restaurant in the hotel because they've put, a, put him up for two, three days and they've, you know, provided all his food and stuff. So he's going to take them out that evening. So like the third evening he's been in Trondheim. And then he has a sort of panic about, um, or maybe that guy will do a runner. You know, I shouldn't be here. So he, he, he does sort of leave them, his friends a message that he's had to go back, he's been called back to Oslo on urgent business without saying what that business is. But he's left them in the lurch. He's not really treated them that nicely. Anyway, so he's back in Oslo and he realises, you know, it's after the new year now, he's going to return to giving lectures at college and the guy is still there, so he's not going anywhere. And um, when he's at college... He sort of slips back into, you know, his day job, as it were. And we get another sort of discursion of his mind where he thinks, well, actually, it's a bit of a miracle that the nature of art of Henrik Ibsen, the sort of theatre of the 18th, 19th century Norway, does reach back to the uh, sort of tragedies of the ancient Greeks, that there is a link, that they do have something in common. They, there's something that binds them together as theatre, as drama which sort of gainsays what he'd said before. Then he sort of accidentally meets this guy in a restaurant and they have a bit of interaction, which I won't spoil. And then finally, we get the section that sort of brought me round, as I say, where it's sort of a moral discussion about... or not discussion, I mean, it's an internal debate about, you know, whether morality truly does stem from God and if so, then he's not, he has no power. He's a, an avowed atheist, but he has no power to avoid it if morality is, is genuinely from the divine. Versus, well, if he doesn't ever reveal to anybody that this crime took place, if he keeps it within himself, then he's disproving the, present, the, 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 the existence of God, um, which is a sort of free will argument. But actually, I found by that stage, I was gripped. I, you know, I was really won over. I thought that sort of he'd set it up as a detective thriller, which never develops. We're not given the motivations. He, whenever he makes a decision and refuses to really engage in it, other than sort of keep sort of spying on this guy, keeping the whole thing to himself, um, it wasn't really stacking up. But by the end, I've had sort of by now four or five discussions, and all of them, I believe were about the collective versus the individual. So harping back to his friends around the dinner table about whether they were all bourgeois or whether they were just individual traits and idiosyncrasies. Back to this thing about individual morality or are we all bound by the same code and, and stuff. And as I say, by then, I thought, yeah, actually, <laughs> I really, really like this. Four and a half stars. And on to Walking by Thomas Bernhard, which is a buddy read with um, Bob Black. Now, I'm going to tell you my thoughts on Bernard. This is my fourth or fifth book of his. And this is what I feel about him. They're all, all his books are the same, and yet they're not. The same themes, the same tone, the same repetition, the same um, narrative voice, really. And yet each one slightly tweaks it enough to make each one fresh. You know, some of the targets are targeted in different ways from book to book to book, uh, which, I, you know, I appreciate. So that's the first thing. The second thing is his humour. They are funny, but it's very... It's a, a humour that I... It's, I can't call it brittle, because the humour's... You know, Bernard is, is brutal. He's, he's not writing brittle prose or brittle comedy. But there's something whereby the comedy can fall flat, I feel. It's teetering. Um, it's very much embedded in the sort of literary and intellectual nature, which makes it a bit sort of, as I say, that does make it brittle. But he always avoids, or so far, he's always avoided the humour falling flat. You know, the tone is acerbic, it's coruscating, and it's funny. It is funny, and I'll give a couple of examples from this book when I start talking about this book. So what I feel about Bernhard is I'm going to read all his 
um, oeuvre gradually, not in a rush to read them all. And each time I pick up a new title, I will expect that to be the book that bursts my Bernhard bubble and think, actually, it's, it's not all it's cracked up to be. But underlying that is the, is the possibility, the distinct possibility, when I read the final one, I go, actually, it was teetering on collapse all through, you know, on the point of every book I read, but it never got there. It works. It holds up. So I can't give you, you know, a judgment. I'm like not even halfway there, probably, of his prose work. But I do feel it could go either way. Anyway, talking about this one specifically, it starts off in a really good way, funny, a funny way. So this guy in, in Vienna has two regular daily walks with friends, one on a Monday, one on a Wednesday. And one of them, and the, the two friends are different, and one of them goes eastwards around the city and the other goes westwards. One of those friends has had a mental breakdown and been carted off to a mental hospital called Steinhoff. And he's in the part where he's never coming out, basically. This is the latest and most catastrophic mental episode for this guy. So the guy he's left behind thinks, I need a new walking partner. I need to find someone to fill my Mondays or Wednesday, whichever one of the two it was. So he asked the guy who does the other day that if he will join him so that he is preserving his routine unchanged, having two walks a week, one east, one west. Whereas for the other guy, the guy he's asked, he's now being uprooted in his routine because from one walk a week, he's now having two. And the other one went west and now he's had to go east or vice versa. So it's very geometric. The, the, the setup is very geometric, uh, I found. Um, and it's, it's basically the, the, this guy called Ola uh, um, just sort of, you know, talking to this other guy, the guy he's, he's, um, he's um, imposed upon to join him for the second walk a week who doesn't really say much in the novel. Um, but a lot of the novels talk about the guy who's been carted off to Steinhoff, you know, what caused it and everything. Um, and amongst his targets are psychiatry, uh, Aust the Austrian state. So there's a very funny uh, bit at the beginning, and then we get the sort of what I see as the bookend of it, where initially he sees all these kids on, on the road, just sort of, you know, larking about. And he's, he, he's absolutely incensed that the Austrian state, sort of being a welfare state, he says basically uh, these kids wouldn't be born without the benefits paid out to their parents, that it um, encourages childbirth. So you have all these, these uh, overpopulated kids as he sees it. So you've got the sort of cradle to the grave welfare state. This is the cradle that he's blaming the state for basically funding and encouraging um, childbirth. And then uh, a scientist acquaintance of, of them both uh, was his laboratory, his re research laboratory, was basically funded by the state, and they refused to renew the funding. And the scientist ended up killing himself, committing suicide. And so now he's raging that, you know, this is, um, this is the grave aspect. So the cradle is funding the birth of kids, and the, and the grave is driving your best minds, your intellectuals, to suicide because you're so mean and penny-pinching. And that's another thing about Bernhard across all his books. He's an intellectual snob. Uh, all his characters are, but I assume he was too. He basically only has a pantheon of two people. Uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, the philosopher, and Glenn Gould, the musician, the pianist. And these are recurring characters or references in his books. Wittgenstein's in here. Can't remember if Glenn Gould is or not. I think he was once briefly mentioned. Um... But it's funny, you know, the, the, the rage against these targets, such as the Austrian state, is, is funny, such as, the, you know, the rage against psychiatrists is funny. But the, the funniest part is when he finally gets to the revelation of what caused the final breakdown of his friend. So they were on a walk, they'd gone to a, a male gentleman outfitters, as they all, you know, very frequently did, and uh, the friend asked to see the trousers, uh, sort of hand-stitched hand, uh, trousers. And what he did is he holds each pair up to the light. And in doing so, you get sort of um, patches of where the light shines through 
uh, the material where it doesn't in other places. And this guy rages, saying that this just shows the cheapness of the material. There's, you know, I'm not querying your skills as tailors because the, the craftsmanship is very high, but the materials you use are inferior. You've got to change it. He refers to them as Czechoslovakian fabrics in a, in a sort of a dismissive way. And basically gets into gets into a huge argument with the, the tailor and his son over this and that eventually the police are called and, and he's carted off to the, the asylum. So it's fairly brutal, but actually the, the notion of, you know, raging and fulminating about, you know, patches of light in trouser fabric when held up to the light, I just found that sort of very funny, really. Um, so, yeah, I really enjoyed this. Uh, it's one of his earlier books. Again, I gave it four and a half. And on to Sergio Chefiek's My Two Worlds. This was gifted me by the very same Bob Black, who I probably read this with. And it, in fact, it's another book about walking. Uh, so this is a book called Walking and about walking. This is um, about a guy who finds himself... Uh, he's a writer. He's been to a book a festival in a publishing do in Brazil. And um, he decides he's going to, uh, like he does everywhere else he visits, visits that he's going to walk around one of the significant parks in the city. Uh, he's not, he's never been there before. He's unfamiliar. He buys himself a map, and the map obviously is a two-dimensional representation of the city. And initially, he finds it very hard to to follow from the map to actually locate the park. But once he's in the park. He's uh, really sort of narrating all the different all the different sections of the park. So there's an aviary, there's a fountain, there's um, you know he remarks on the paths that have been so sort of you know the well trodden paths literally are sort of dusty and eroded, whereas the lesser known tracks are, are sort of you know in much better shape. But no one walks them. Um, so he's remark he's remarking and compartmentalising all the different parts of the park. Because I think, and it's called My Two Worlds, I think because he himself is a two-dimensional printed map and he's trying to unfurl himself to find the third dimension of himself. Um, but that's about all I can say about this book. It didn't really work for me. There was one bit of writing which I thought was fabulous. So the guy can write, there's no doubt about that. But as an overall concept, the book didn't really work for me. Generally, when I walk, I look down. The ground is one of the most revealing indicators of the present condition. It is more eloquent in its damages, its deterioration, its unevenness and irregularities of all sorts. I'm referring to urban as well as rural ground, difficult or congenial. And I'm specifically referring to the ground of paths, to ground altered by humans in general, because ground in the abstract, the ground of the old world, sorry, the ground of the world, speaks different, near incomprehensible languages. Walking is, in part, a kind of superficial archaeology, which I find greatly instructive and somehow moving, because it considers evidence that's humble, irrelevant, even random, the exact opposite of a scientific investigation. It's evidence that, because of its unimportance and its secondary nature, restores a way of inhabiting time. One is an eyewitness to the anonymous, to what history can't classify, and simultaneously witness to what will survive with some difficulty. And for that reason, when I walk on paths, I've been inclined to leave behind faint minimal marks. The proverbial, the proverbial initials or the name drawn in the dirt with a stick. Ephemera that vanish quickly from the ground or from walls, like sodden footsteps on a rainy day or shoe prints. Not because I believe someone would decipher them in my wake, but because the action implies an innate impulse. One could only hope to leave fleeting traces. I think when he's, you know, that reflection, that little meditation was great, but actually the strength of the book I found was when he was describing the, what he saw in the park. When he tried to relate them back to himself, that was far less successful for me. Now, I seem to have read quite a few books about walking within the last two years. These two within a week. Uh, early in the year, I read the Michel Butor book, which is essentially a, um, a British northern industrial town through walking around it, you know, following your same networks, your same pathways. Um, I actually think on reflection, though, 
the more successful books about walking are these older books. Well, I suppose the Butel was written in the 50s. Milkman, where, you know, set in Northern Ireland during the Troubles, where a young girl is walking with her nose perpetually pressed in a Victorian novel because she can't bear to see what's going on around her. Fabulous, fabulous book. Paul Oster, the New York Trilogy, where New York, uh, it's sort of uh, geography and architecture, but particularly of things like litter and crap pavements, plays a sort of significant role in, in a sort of detective um, style metaphysical novel. And finally, geometric regional novel by Austrian Gert Jonker, which does what it says on the tin. It is literally describing a village through taking a, a perambulation around it. Uh, very subversive, very good fun. So I'm kind of done with walking books and, you know, I'm not really a flaneur. Um, so, yeah, uh, I've had my fill of them this year, even though I really enjoyed the Bernhard. Um, it's not what I'd call a classic novel of walking. And on to uh, The Geography of Rebels by Maria Gabrielle Lansol. And uh, I have to say, I, oh, sorry, I think I gave my two worlds, I think I gave it three stars. I might have given it two and a half. Yeah, so uh, talking of relatively low uh, ratings, uh, The Geography of Rebels, uh, I gave three stars. I really didn't get on with it at all. Um, it has many echoes such as a fever dream, only it's not a dream, it's more like a mystical vision, which makes you then think of Clarice Lispector's The Passion According to G.H., uh, which I infinitely prefer because although they have sort of similar intensities, the musings in Lispector's novel are all um, tied back to the sight of a crushed cockroach. Whereas here, they're never really anchored to anything. Um, what else? Oh, Nietzsche's, uh, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Uh, the first part of that is very much, you know, similar sort of tone and, and to, to this book. So what is it? In as much as I can tell you what this book is. It's a narrator who's a writer, and she has these fevered visions of mystic, medieval mystics and a Protestant martyr from Germany who kept being sh moved on uh, from town to town because he wasn't welcome with his sort of subversive views and it ended up being the figurehead of a peasant revolt in Germany which was crushed and he was executed and had his head cut off. So and we also have Nietzsche. So these are sort of in the pantheon of this writer's spiritual and mental life and, and the, first two th the first two parts of the trilogy which I actually found surprisingly more accessible. Um, you keep getting re repeated scenarios with these characters coming and going and animals coming in from the forest and joining them. So we keep getting reference to this, this Protestant martyr. Sometimes he's headless, sometimes his head is also present, but not on his shoulders, you know, this kind of thing. We get St John of the Cross, who was a, a mystic writer. We get Anna de Palanosa, mystic writer. All this, these characters sort of come and go, but they, there's no sort of material reality. It's all clearly a mystic vision in, inside somebody's head. And one of the themes, uh, the writer very much sees herself as being part of that, that peasant army of absolute poverty. But another is this theme of, of writing, and writing about death particularly. And uh, so St John of the Cross says... He wants to die so that he can write about it because he's never experienced death. Whereas the, the martyr, uh, the guy who's had his head chopped off, um, obviously it's happening again and again and again in the, in the book. So each time he goes, you know, I don't know what it's going to feel like to die at the point at which he's going to be killed. So I kind of, I was OK with the first two thirds, but it's really the third part when the narrator seems to be in, back in the material world much more. I mean, it's still very much sort of mystic stuff, but she's in some sort of nunnery or convent, I should say. And I really couldn't get any value out of that last final part. And given that, I then couldn't tie it together, the whole book together. So, you know, I'm not into sort of 
you know, religious-based mysticism. Um, and I, I couldn't really get the programme on this book, I'm afraid, so I, I think I gave it two and a half. And on to Kate Atkinson. So in the same way as I gave my history with Vit uh, Vitkinson, with uh, Barnhard, I'm going to do the same here. So Kate Atkinson I first um, encountered when she was writing about her detective uh, hero uh, figure called Jackson Brody. And I really liked her Jackson Brody books because they were detective fiction, but with a bit of sort of reflection upon modern life. And uh, the psychology was quite interesting. Then she went on to do a trilogy of, about, of books set in history around the First World War and the Second World War. The first one was called A God in Ruins, and I hated it. I hated its flimsy premise whereby characters die, but they don't really die. They come back on alternative historical um, pathways. You know, that their life could have gone differently, or does go differently from the previous incarnation. I hated it. I read the second one, I can't even remember what it was called, which was set in the Second World War with some of the characters from the first one. And I, I couldn't bring myself to read the final one. I just wasn't interested. And she's gone back to Jackson Brody. You know, I think this is possibly her first book since that trilogy. So that's why I picked this up, because I'm a Jackson Brody fan. But in here, Jackson Brody is middle-aged. He has less physical prowess, um, which does take the edge. Off him, you know. I'm I'm older than Jackson Brody is in this book, so I'm not being ageist about this. But he's not the same guy. I mean, that's the point. But it actually made him less enjoyable. And the book starts off. It sort of notionally reprints an invite to a murder mystery weekend in a stately home. And you think, oh great, that's a really you know good idea. And then we, after that, after you've been introduced to that, you get. Chapter after chapter after chapter, introducing a whole cast of char real life characters. I say real life, real life in the book. They're not the actors play. You know, the murder mystery doesn't appear until page three hundred. Instead, we get these, you know, these, as I say, these sort of character studies and character histories of um, a vicar who has no, a priest who has no faith, the stately home widow who who still owns it, but absolute penury, have to sell all their paintings one by one. Her scheming uh, sons who are trying to modernise the, the stately home to make it solvent. Um, we get a, an Iraq war veteran who's got a false leg. He had a leg blown off by a, an IED. So we get all these quite recognisable characters, quite honestly. They are slightly stereotypical. The only interesting one is uh, an art thief. Um, who basically he plays the long game, that she sort of embeds herself into these families for six months before making her move. So we've had this murder mystery invite. Then it's all about the theft of two paintings, from one from the stately home and one from um, somewhere, you know, uh, somewhere else. And Jackson Brody is not holding this together. I mean, he doesn't appear in half the chapters because, as I say, the chapters are devoted to these character studies of, of other people. And then you get to the murder mystery and you think, OK, finally, you know, we're in the stately home. All the characters are gathered together. There are distinct echoes with the, uh, the murder mystery play that's been invented for the entertainment of, of the paying guests. Uh, but for some reason, a, uh, an escaped convict who's a psychopath is, is suddenly thrown into the mix and is at large, which makes no sense whatsoever. And for a psychopath, he's pretty easily defeated. I mean, sorry if that's a spoiler, but he's a pretty pathetic psychopath, quite honestly. Um, and yes, the you know, there are deliberate resonances and echoes of a sort of Victorian murder mystery as if it was penned by Agatha Christie with... These real life, you know, the priest is echoes the priest in the murder mystery. The the stately home widow echoes the the stately home female owner. It, so there are lots of obvious parallels, but because you've got this mad element suddenly thrown in of, of the psychopath who has nothing to do with the plot of the murder mystery, and also we know that at the heart of this is these stolen paintings. It just doesn't work. It doesn't hang together at all. It's not engaging. And I'm going to read uh, just one thing, which I think actually 
sums up what I felt about it. So that the, this is a homage to the sort of uh, queens of Victorian crime novelists such as Agatha Christie and people like that. So this is, this is d describing the uh, the murder mystery play that's going to be acted out. The body walks have been peopled with all the stock characters that usually appeared in Nancy Stiles' Agatha Christie, bloodless plots. Ben had read the entire oeuvre during the course of the rainy afternoons of his school holidays. The novels belonged to his father, who was a surprising devotee of crime fiction. The books, all first edition hardbacks that might be worth something now, contained a cast of retired majors, country vicars and amateur sleuths. Not to mention English and foreign aristocrats, mysterious strangers, lovely young girls and slinky temptresses. Would Burton make Peace's Murder and Mystery Weekend take its inspiration from Styles? I believe so, Fran said. Butlers and corpses everywhere, I should think. Unfortunately, it's not just the, the sort of, you know, the, the sort of fictional conceit of the murder mystery weekend that is so stock. This whole bloody book is. Two stars. On to Victoria Chang with my Back to the World. So this is the third of her collections I've read and I'll post links to the other two. This is a really interesting book. Um, it is a conversation in verse with an abstract artist, the work of an abstract artist called Agnes Martin. And it's really ask. I think both, it, it's asking the question of whether, whether and how art manages to tackle human emotion, be it depression, be it grief, even be it joy. Now, you know, visual art, I'm not talking about sort of, you know, modern day video art and stuff like that, but visual art is basically non-lingual, uh, other than a title. But a lot of Agnes Martin's works were actually called untitled and just had the year that they were produced in. And Chang reproduces um, faithfully uh, the titles of Agnes Martin's work. So some of these poems are called Untitled 1953, or whatever the year is. Um, she uses the same titles that, that Martin does. I mean, obviously, text does increasingly appear in modern art. You know, if you think about um, uh, Magritte's... Uh, picture of a pipe and it goes ceci nesca un peep this is not a pipe so words do actually begin to um, proliferate and pollute uh, visual art but this, this this is abstract art you know words aren't really here and that's the conversation she's setting up so for example she considers the difference between the impact on one's sort of feelings and instincts of horizontal lines as against vertical lines or where there's sort of squares and cubes in a Martin painting, she sort of equates that to our own compartmentalising abilities of putting things in different boxes, be it to hide them away or to keep them unpolluted or whatever. There's, there's you know, as I say, a really interesting dialogue uh, between these two different art forms, one lingual, one non-lingual, and yet can they achieve the same emotional impact? I thought it was really, really interesting. Uh, I gave it four and a half stars. And on to um, Hervé Guibert, to the friend who did not save my life. So this was a sensation in France when it came out in the late 80s, uh, because it basically outed uh, Michel Foucault as, uh, if he was already known to be gay, uh, it certainly outed the fact that he died of AIDS, and that um, he uh, was into BDSM. Now, France has incredibly tight privacy laws, possibly the most stringent within the Western world. So this caused a huge shock because France doesn't have pop stars. France has intellectuals, which it treats as pop stars, of which uh, Foucault was one. So, uh, he, you know, uh, it, as I said, it was a shock. And I think Guibert came in for a lot of criticism for revealing... Um, Sort of such truths about a friend of his. But as, as Guibet, who also had AIDS and died of AIDS, as he himself wrote, um, what right did I have to use friendship in such a mean fashion? And with someone I adored with all my heart, and then I sensed, it's extraordinary, a kind of vision or vertigo that gave me complete authority, putting me in charge of these ignoble transcripts and legitimising them by revealing to me so it's what's called a premonition, a powerful presentiment, that I was completely entitled to do this since it wasn't so much my friend's last agony I was describing as it was my own, which was waiting for me and be just like his. 
for it was now clear that besides being bound by friendship, we would share the same fate in death. So he's justifying um, spilling the beans because he's going to go down the same path because of the nature at that time of AIDS being a death sentence. I'm not sure that's a legitimate defence. I mean, you can think the thoughts, certainly, but then to make them public, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it doesn't seem that significant to me, uh, sort of 40 years later, although maybe it does with things like the right to be forgotten. But it's a... It's a Basically, this is an AIDS chronicle. Um, Gibe was overtaken by a huge... Once he knew that he had AIDS, he was overtaken by a huge impetus to basically complete every single book that was left in him. So he went on this sort of real writing spree towards the end of his life, of which this was one, because um, he wanted to make sure they got finished. So this is slightly underworked, um, but I don't think it suffers for that. You know, it's a chronicle, but it's sort of jumps around all over the chronology um but again i i i don't think i don't think that's a a, a mark against it at all it's well written in parts it's inconsistent in it but some parts it's really well written the character studies in parts are very good it is quite bitchy not just on the likes of Foucault, but on all of its <laughs> circle of writers and intellectuals um to the friends who did not save my life. It's not a reference to Foucault. It's a reference to this American who was um, a pharmaceutical sort of industrialist or whatever, who uh, had ties to an American um, researcher, medical researcher, who was trying to find a, a, a cure for AIDS. Um, and this American intermediary kept saying to Guy Bear, we'll get you on this guy's program even though you're in France we'll get you over to America and we'll make sure you don't get the placebo in a blind control test we make sure you get the actual drugs and he never came through so that's why Guy Bear is is uh, who he's referring to as the friend who did not save my life um there's some very funny bits um the actress oh what's her name um the one who, who, who married Warren Beatty Isabella Ajani, <laughs> she was a, a close friend of Gieber's and uh, she comes in for a, a shooing. Um, no one really escapes his 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 gaze. Um, there's a very funny scene where this old Catholic priest is dying of AIDS and um, Gieber and a couple of friends decide they're going to give him one sort of last hurrah and they smuggle a, a beautiful boy into this priest's um, vest chambers or whatever. And he's he's stripped there nude um, to sort of give him a, a sort of a visual thrill, uh, but it all goes horribly wrong. It's a very funny scene. But as I say, some of the writing is like really, really sort of quite incisive. Um, whereas before, I'd always found Jules's body powerful and splendid whenever he undressed. Now I noticed he'd lost weight and looked almost pitiful. As for Berta, who is this man Jules's wife. Um, she harboured against her will a growing revulsion towards Jules' body because of the virus which had taken on an almost corporeal existence when it stopped being a, share, a dreaded possibility and became official and we both knew that Jules couldn't live and wouldn't survive unless he felt desired an erotic abandonment caused by the virus as one of its secondary effects would be for him at least in the beginning more deadly than the virus itself and would eat away more dangerously at his spirit than at his body. Jules, who seemed so solid in every way, would cover his eyes in the movies like a woman or an overly sensitive child whenever the screen threatened to erupt in cruelty. So beautifully sort of incisive that, you know, this guy Jules has to feel desire. His wife won't go near him because he's diseased. So he's always had this on-off sort of casual relationship with Gima gay relationship so his wife sort of is happy for him to continue with Gieber because it kind of gets her off the hook for not desiring him anymore uh this is I think that what's particularly interesting about this is it's a an AIDS chronicle which is very different and it's obviously French which is very different from the American AIDS chronicles such as like those by Larry Kramer so I think it's a really good um, sort of historical snapshot. I mean, Guy Bear died. He wrote. He managed to sort of finish about four or five books that he set himself the target. But he did die of AIDS in the end. So I gave this four stars. I'm not sure I'd want to read any more of his work. But you know, anyway. And finally, very briefly, uh, this little art by Kate Briggs, uh, who wrote the wonderful uh, the long form novel 
this is non-fiction, it's about translation and translators and whether it is a new piece of art, whether it's plagiarism, all these sort of timeless questions about translation. But it's really good, it's really well written. Uh, she brings a lot of sort of personal stuff to it. She herself is translating uh, Roland Barthes' final three uh, lecture series at university, which haven't been uh, previously translated. So there's a lot of stuff about the role of the author and the role of the reader and where the translator fits into that. The translator is a kind of reader and rewriter. Um, so this was a really good, solid um, take on the subject. Four stars. And that's it. Uh, I'm currently reading Michelle Welbeck's new novel, uh, Annihilation. I've got several shorter books I'm really excited to get to. Um, but till then, next time, thanks very much.